All right, you guys, we're back to another episode. We are going to be talking about some saints, some drama of the saints. <laughs> It'll be All Saints Day when we That's release right. this episode. So hopefully November this is, 1st. This will just feel very in tune with the world. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a couple of different saints that we want to talk about and what they're like known for. So we're just going to, I guess, dive right in. I will go for So we'll, we will have varying degrees of like how deep we're going to go into some saints. Some we just have like a few funny like tidbits about them that we'll share with you. And some of them we'll kind of like deep dive a little bit more because they're a little bit more effed up. Because and. Melissa just kept researching and researching and researching. <laughs> Kelly glazed over <laughs> her saints. And also, we don't really know. Like, we kind of know what saints we have, but we don't know at the same time. Because we just did a quick, like, just to make sure we weren't covering the same saints and uh, researching the same ones. So we kind of know what saints we have. But, like, we don't know what their saintly duties were. <laughs> Right. I saved. I purposefully purposefully didn't tell Kelly all the stuff I was finding because I wanted to see her real reaction. Right. Yeah. Because apparently Melissa has some good ones. So I do. And actually, this first one that I'm going to cover, we did already talk about. So this one won't be a surprise to you yeah. because we had you came over my house one night like a month ago over my parents house Saturday, <laughs> Saturday and, night by the way <laughs> on a Saturday night and this is what we did we just sat and just like googled saints and just <laughs> laughed hysterically at the most effed up stuff that that we could find so and without remember this too. we believed in all this by the way yes so I think that's part of this is like as we read this stuff it's so funny to me because it's like this is obviously not true right <laughs> and, <laughs> and we believed it like growing up and all of this and as you read it now as an adult you're just like this is ridiculous Binka, never. <laughs> so without further ado we're going to start with the first one which is Mother Cabrini Mother Cabrini was Italian. Uh, just to set the stage, this was like early 1900s when a lot of Italians were immigrating to the U.S. And so she was born in Italy and she started to get into that religious life, whatever it was. And somehow she got she was like looking for an assignment and she got sent to New York City to help kind of accept and deal with the Italian immigrants that were coming over at that time and help them kind of get situated and get started. And this is all wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I have no bad things to say about Mother Caprini, okay? Yeah. Apparently, from what I can read, she devoted her life to helping these immigrants get situated in a new world, and I am for that cause. So, right, same. Wonder wonderful. But it starts to get a little bit, She so she did a little, she did wonderful work, and then she died. And that's where it just gets, starts to get weird for me, and this is going to be a theme with like most of the saints that, that we talk about, but they exhume her body after her death. And this is the term that they use. And we'll cite all of our research articles and documents, which are mostly Wikipedia, but we'll, we'll <laughs> cite got that. We got a Catholicism one in there. <laughs> Catholicism.org. Oh, yeah. um, we'll cite all of that in the show notes, but her body quote, was divided as part of the process towards sainthood at that time her head was removed and is pre preserved in one chapel no her heart is preserved somewhere else <laughs> an no. arm an arm bone is at her national shrine in chicago <laughs> and most of the rest of her body is at her major shrine in new york and i just the whole wow. process of exhuming and dividing the bodies of saints is the whole uh, rest in peace thing just went <laughs> right out the window, huh? <laughs> there was no peace to be had for Mother Cabrini. So she ended up becoming, so as they went through her process for sainthood, she ended up becoming the patron saint of immigrants, which power to, her, power to her. Love that for her. But the funniest part that I read about this whole thing was that 
so aside from being a patron saint for something, you can be an intercessor for something like people can pray to you for a particular thing. Mm -hmm. And people are known to pray to her for finding a parking space. Okay. And so when we go out to Boston in a few weeks, we can't <laughs> find a parking space. So we know who we're hitting up. <laughs> oh my God. There's a, there, no, no. Yo, Mother Cabrini. <laughs> no, listen, I didn't have this in my notes, but I am recalling that there is a, like a rhyme. It's like, Mother Cabrini, Mother Cabrini, please help me park my machine or something <laughs> like that. Okay. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's something like that. But this Wikipedia article goes on to say, and I quote, so she's also informally recognized as an effective intercessor for finding a parking space. As one priest explained, she lived in New York City. She understands traffic. <laughs> Oh, so she's pretty dope then. <laughs> she's helping immigrants, helping us find traffic in these big cities. Finding yo, spots, I mean. Yo, I mean, really cool. As far as saints go, like there were some fucked up ones and this, sh whatever. No hate to her whatsoever. But like, where did the parking spaces like Come have anything from. to do with yeah. anything? A lot of these are kind of like, what did it, what, so how do they, how, like, how do they come with it? Like, I don't get it. I have one guy that's a disease, and at the same time, he's also coffee. <laughs> so it's for like how? being the patron saint patron for saint. both. Yeah. It's like, how, how do you go from a disease to coffee? All right. Do you want to do one next? Yeah. So mine's is a little quick one, too. Mine's is Saint Isadora, Isadora of S Seville. He was born around 536 AD, so way back. And he is known as the patron saint of the lovely internet. <laughs> somebody so somebody <laughs> born in 500 AD is the patron saint of the internet. Yep. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you make, the logic why. <laughs> make it make sense. It doesn't. It doesn't. None of it. So he was actually nominated by Pope John Paul II, which I think that's the cute little old pope that died, right? The old man. The I don't know. One. Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> Aren't they all John Paul? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, so he was nominated because in 1997, the pope decided that the internet could use a saint to guide Catholics <laughs> to use the internet properly, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> too many catholics were on like <laughs> rotten.com in 1997 like or you know some other some other sites let's just say <laughs> we'll keep it pg uh for now so so his little story is he seems like a cool dude so his little story is he tried to record everything he that was known at the time he wrote a 20 book known as and i'm probably gonna screw this up as an en entomological, I can Google translate this in a second so I don't make anybody mad. Entomologia. So that was the name of the book. <laughs> also, <laughs> also known as Origins. I could have just said that, but I wanted to give the guy his uh, the props, his real name. And it was published after his death in 636. So, of course, they always get credit after they die. Um, it was considered to be the encyclopedia of, of its time and had all of the human knowledge. It was a tool used by many to seek answers, much how like the internet is used today. And so there's 20 of these and he has many other books. So I didn't deep dive into all the books, but some of the titles I'll give you. So like book number four is titled Treats of Medicine in Libraries. Book 12 is Beast and Birds. Book 17 is Agricultural. And book 19 is Ships, Houses, and Clothes. So he has just 20 of these with a bunch of them. <laughs> like just this. his own ass encyclopedia <laughs> that he yeah. was just making at the time. <laughs> and so that's his little story. I thought he was kind of cool. He was a scholar and stuff. So, you know, smart. But do you remember when... So I never owned encyclopedias, but I think you did. Oh, I definitely, yeah. I had multiple <laughs> sets of encyclopedias, yes. 
Yes. Yeah, do you remember if someone came to your door to sell them or did you like go to a store and buy them? Oh, you know, I'd have like, to ask I, my mom, but I <laughs> bet they, they had this one set. I don't know if it was Britannica or what it was, but that set looked like it came from a door to door salesman. <laughs> and then I had a second set that was like, it looked like it was like a hand me down from, you know. Yeah. From family member, maybe. Family member Ooh, way before yeah. my time. And that one, who knows where that came from. But I guarantee that the like nice leather bound wow. set that we had was probably a door to door salesman. So I just, as I was, you know, reading about this, about this man, I was laughing because all I could think about was I know you watched Friends when a door door to door salesman went to Joey's apartment to and try he got to the V. <laughs> he got the V encyclopedia. <laughs> and it was all he talked about was like was Mount Vesuvius. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my god. So, yeah, so that's my little guy. He's a scholar and he's smart. And of course he gets acknowledged after he dies. And the Pope thought it'd be cool to make him the patron saint of the internet. I love so, that for him. Yep. I love that for him. <laughs> if he could only see now what, what the internet, what the internet has become. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's come a long way since his little hier hieroglyphics <laughs> in his little books. And like his books are probably just innocent things. Like innocent topics, you know, farming, animals, and then the internet is just vile. <laughs> <laughs> That's yep. <laughs> so I'm gonna go from there. I'm gonna go into another one that has a little more meat. It's not one of the effed up ones yet. We'll see. I'm, okay. I'm kind of we're building to those. Okay, but this one I'm going. I chose because it's just. It's got some good stuff in it. All right. And so this is St. Anthony of Padua. So, and he was woo -woo. Portuguese. Woo woo. So <laughs> setting the stage, the year is 1195. He was born in Lisbon, I believe, to wealthy parents. And then the Padua, Padua is in Italy and that comes in like kind of later in his life. But mm -hmm. I, this is the church I grew up going to, St. Anthony of Padua. Okay. So this one just kind of hit home for me. And when I read this story, I just cackled at how ridiculous this all is. So he was known for like preaching and he actually became a preacher by accident. Like I guess there was some event where like a sermon was supposed to be held and all these people gathered and then like nobody showed up to give the sermon. Like everyone was pointing fingers at like, no, you were supposed to give the sermon. No, you were supposed <laughs> to give the sermon. And so somebody just like kind of like pushed it. You're like, yo, Anthony, hey, get up there on the pulpit. And he had like never done anything before. And so he gets up there and apparently he did a decent job. <laughs> okay, yeah. because then people started wanting to come and listen to him preach. So, yeah. so the theme with a lot of St. Anthony's stories that I'm about to tell is that there were a lot of non-believers that he was always around a bunch of non-believers. And that's where all these ridiculous stories come from. So the first one was one of his miracles that's attested to him for becoming a saint is mm -hmm. the miracle of preaching to the fish. So he was out preaching and a bunch of people were like, we don't believe you, blah, blah, blah. And then he, so he wanders away and goes to the shoreline and starts just preaching off the shoreline. And all these fish started gathering next to him. And then he was like... <laughs> The fish are more receptive to my message than you, non-believers. And they were like, oh, no. And then they started believing. And I'm like, that is just the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah. Fish usually, like, swim away if you're in the ocean. <laughs> I don't even think he was in the ocean. He was just, like, at the, the shore. <laughs> shoreline. I'm sure he baited those fish. I'm sure he was throwing some pup suction in that water to get all those fish to come. Right. So that he could be like, look at all these fish. <laughs> they, they're Catholic fish. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so that was back was to the fishes girls. that Jesus fed, right? The fishes and the loaves, right? <laughs> this was this was one of his miracles. That counts as a miracle to yeah. saying. The fish All just right. gathered in front of you. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't take much to be a saint, does it? 
Do you know how many times I step in the water and the fish gather around? Like, come on. <laughs> so this next one is my favorite. It's my favorite. So he found himself again in the presence of non-believers. Yo, he needs to just stop hanging out with non-believers. Yes. And so <laughs> they challenged him. They gave him a challenge and they said, I want you to prove the sanctity of the Eucharist to me. Like, prove to me that this is really the body of Christ. Oh, how are we going to do this, Anthony? How are we going to do this, Anthony? I don't know. So the Come man, on, Tony. So the man who, this non-believer guy who's like challenging him, he brings over a mule, a half-starved mule. <laughs> which why, why did you have to starve the mule to do this i don't know so he brings this half starved mule over and then he presents him with two choices so on the one hand he gives him he has this fresh agricultural feed i don't know if they call it fodder or something like that and on his other hand he has the body of christ the eucharist the mule did not eat the fresh fodder he also did not eat the eucharist but he bowed down to the Eucharist. No. <laughs> no, he did not. That mother ever is going to the feed. <laughs> no way. He, this is this is again a miracle nope. that is documented <laughs> formally and officially as road to sainthood. I want to see the a mule bowed down to no. the Eucharist. My dog would run right to the food. I'm sorry. My dog isn't bowing down to me. <laughs> like, bitch, I'm hungry. I'm going to the food. All I, I can see the receipt. I want to see the messages. <laughs> All I can picture in my head as I'm like thinking about this occurring is the movie Shrek and Donkey. I was just and, like, that's <laughs> dog. Literally, that's what I was thinking about. I don't know if it's the only donkey that I am aware of. <laughs> Oh my god. So Can you see that donkey bowing down? No, he's going to go eat. He's going to eat. Donkey going to eat. Yeah. Oh uh, my god. So he was challenged a third time by non-believers. Dude, he's got to get away with these non-believers. You can't surround he, yourself with these type of people. He was dining with them, which like why are you why are these your friends? I don't know. But he's dining with these non-believers and he realized that the food that they put in front of him was poisoned in an attempt to kill him. Oh, she said you got to stop hanging out with toxic people. So they admitted to <laughs> they admitted to attempting to kill him. And then they said but hey, uh, whatever, there was some thing at the time that if in the Bible, I guess, I don't know, was the Bible out oh, at this <laughs> point in time? It is said, apostles of Christ, if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. And so he blessed the food. He gave it a little, bless, bless us, oh Lord, for these are <laughs> gifts, gifts we are about to receive. <laughs> And he ate it, and he suffered no harm. Voila! <laughs> so wait, are these people not getting charged for, like, attempted murder? It's they a miracle! Just, <laughs> they just got away with it, though? A modern-day miracle. He did eventually die, which I, this, this is so fucked up. <laughs> he did casual. eventually die in his, like, 30s, which apparently, like, all these saints died super young. Yeah, he did die, and he died of some like weird disease that like seemed to me like it would have been the result of like long term poisoning. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But well, no man, why is he just hanging around with all these negative people in his life? Why was he, he just with people that like believed in him? I don't know. He is the saint that you pray to for lost goods yeah. right for when you lose something you pray to saint anthony to find it and i guess it's because when he was preaching somebody stole his little book with all of his teachings in it and then he he just like said a prayer that the book would come back and it the guy who stole it felt bad and like brought it back so that's why we pray to him for lost things but is it <sighs> he also is he is he the animal one too? Or am um, I thinking of someone else? 
he could, I could be thinking of somebody else. Maybe. He could be. And the only reason I'm saying that is because like, I feel like there's like a, st- the church I went to, there's like a statue of him where he's like maybe holding like a little <laughs> lamb or something <laughs> in his statue. I think that's what I, I, I'm trying to think. Cause I, I, I honestly think my mom had one of these statues in her like bedroom of him. And I feel like he was also holding a lamb. <laughs> so that's why I thought he was an animal. I still re- he's wearing maybe a brown Maybe it's a coat. mule. Maybe he's holding a mule, a donkey. <laughs> I don't know. He's but, holding the starving donkey. Yes. And so he's the patron saint of Lisbon, Padua, and many other places in Portugal, apparently. And the one other thing was similar on the whole, like, exhuming people's bodies. Man. He got exhumed 30 years after his death. And he was, quote, unquote, turned to dust, but his tongue was, like, in one preserved, piece. preserved immaculately as if it was a living tongue because he was a preacher and that was, like, his. Oh, yeah. It's... It glistened as <laughs> and looked as if it were still part of a live body. I'm not okay and then, with that. <laughs> and then in 1981... Pope John Paul II authorized a scientific team to study his remains and the tomb was opened five days later. I don't really understand because I told you that he he was born in 1195, right? Right. And if he was already dust 30 years after that, (laughs) but then you're going to try to tell me you're going in like 900 years after that and you're going to go exhume in the 80s dust. (laughs) I don't even right. understand. I don't understand. Make it, like you said, make, make it, make it make sense. sense. It doesn't make any sense. Nope. All right. So that's oh, St. Anthony man. in a nutshell. All right. So I'm aware of that one. I do know that one. And I do know, because obviously we weren't taught all of these in school because no. there's just way too many of them. But I do remember St. Anthony learning about him. I you did not he- know about the Eucharist when you were like growing up, though, the donkey. Oh, no, I've said new, <laughs> no. But we just knew of him, and that's why I'm thinking he's the saint for animal. Like, I don't know. But it could be, could maybe not. But I do remember him from school. Um, all right, so I will hop into my little guy. So mine is Saint Drogo. Drogo, that's how Google Translate said it to me. I'm trying to not, I'm trying to respect and not <laughs> say these names wrong. <laughs> Just butcher them, uh, okay? <laughs> so, Saint Drogo was born in 1105 to nobility and lived mainly in France. So, and Saint, I'll get into his story, but real quick, Saint Drogo is known as a patron saint to those who are unattractive. <laughs> of course, he is. <laughs> I just think it's funny because how why do ugly people need a patron saint? And who what like who's considered ugly? Who's considered unattractive? I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I don't believe in any of this, obviously. But everyone's beautiful. This includes people suffering from d- deafness, dumbness. <laughs> Is this from Catholic <laughs> Catholics.org? Uh yeah, or this one is my Catholic Saint Medals.com. <laughs> uh so this includes people suffering from deafness, dumbness, extreme physical afflictions, such as gallstones or hernias and hernias. He's also considered to be a patron saint of Kafa. So he so quick story on him. So he became an often sorry he became an often as a teenager he felt very very guilty towards the death of his mother who died during child's bu- childbirth so I think the mom I read somewhere it was maybe a C section C section he went through penance and real, his father also died they say either later in life or died before he was even born so I don't know if he knows who his dad is or I don't know the situation there. <laughs> So he went through penance to atone for this guilt because he had so much guilt that his mom died because of him. So then at 20 years old, he so obviously he's nobility. So he gave all his money and stuff to the poor 
and gave up his estate to live a life of poverty and penance. He was really depressed that he killed his mom. His charity gained him a lot of affection from everyone. He was a shepherd and he had sheep and he could read the weather and knew how to cure animals of their illnesses. So that's dope. I like that. <laughs> um, so to avoid the danger of all the praise he was getting, he left and went on a pilgrim- pilgrim- pilgrimages. The pilgrimages had to come to an end when his own personal affliction started. So he had a really bad, extreme physical affliction described as, get ready, a disfiguring hernia where tissues or organs such as the bowel protrude from their normal place through a defect in the in the wall surrounding them. They're usually located in the abdomen and can be very painful. And one of the sites said he had a lot of body sores. So... I don't know why. (laughs) So then because of his affliction, this drove him to live a life as a hermit. He lived in solit he lived in a solitary room attached to a church that he frequently attended and only survived on barley, water, and you guess it, the Eucharist. (laughs) And he died in eleven eighty six. So he is recognized as the patron saint of the unattra- of unattractive people because I assume it's because he had this physical affliction as a hernia. That's fucked up. <laughs> oh, my God. First of all, the fact that they start the list of unattractive people with deaf people. Yeah. Like, it's what like- does that have to do with the fucking price of tomatoes? <laughs> like... <laughs> In dumbness. <laughs> yeah. dumbness is another one. You're just dumb. <laughs> if you're dumb, you're dumb. You could be attractive. A lot of dumb people are very attractive. <laughs> attractive. Exactly. So it's like, well, uh, these are really funny, though. <laughs> oh my god, Drogo. Yeah, I. I like I kind of feel bad for him. Yeah, he's he's just in a lot of pain. Forget like, you know, in his mind he thinks he killed his mom. Little does he know. Like, isn't there like a high child birth death mother rate, whatever it is? Like don't in eleven ninety five, you better believe <laughs> Exactly. So it's like don't be so hard on yourself. Why are you giving up all your stuff? Why are you giving up all your money? Oh my god. Could have if you saved some of your money, maybe you could have gotten your hernia taken care of. I don't know what's the what's the <laughs> price of a hernia replacement <laughs> not replacement repair back then. I know. I don't know. All right, so that was my damn my dude. All right, I got how how effed up do we want to go next? Let's see. You know we're gonna go with this woman because you just talked about surviving by eating barely anything and just the Eucharist. And that was like this woman's like. Which that would never happen. Stick. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We need nutrients. So <laughs> this woman is St. Catherine of Siena. Okay. I'm not aware of this one. And the year is 1347, just to kind of put us in time, right? Right. A long time ago. Right before the bubonic plague. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I don't I don't think it's relevant to the story in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> but I just wanted to put that out there. Yep. Her mother had 22 children. Damn. Half 22 children before she had her, not 22 total. So she would have <laughs> been on she would have been on TLC. She would have had a show on TLC. Mm-hmm. Catherine's <laughs> mom plus 22. Yeah. <laughs> so half of the children had already died. Oh, before damn. Catherine was born. So like that was a huge like child take- mortality was like a big thing back then too, I think. Like I think there was like I- you had a 50-50 shot maybe yeah. of like having your kid live. I so- take that TLC joke back. <laughs> yes. So when Catherine was born, she was a twin. Her twin actually died immediately after birth. 
And then her mom goes on to have her 25th child when Catherine's like two years old. It's not relevant to the story in any way, shape, or form. But <laughs> I'm just like 25 children. My God. Or well, she didn't have 25 children. She she birthed 25 children, she which is 25 a feet in and of itself. Yeah, you would know. You would know. I would not know. <laughs> I have one child for a reason <laughs> because it's that unpleasant. Anyways, so sh- this this Catherine had her first Christly vision at age five, which like my daughter is age five right now and sh- <laughs> she ain't having no Christly visions, okay? I don't even know where that would come from. By age seven, she had vowed to give her life to God, okay? So, so just- is, is God grooming her? Yes. <laughs> Just wait. Oh. Just wait. I'm nervous. So, so when she's 16 years old, her older sister dies while she's giving birth to her kid. And then her, Catherine's parents are like, oh, you should marry your sister's widower. So they want her to marry her brother-in-law okay. now. Gotcha. Okay. Because like their sister died. And they're like, oh, well, you just marry one of the other sisters. Like, that's problematic in and of itself. Yeah. But she doesn't want to do this. She absolutely opposed. And she started a strict fasting diet, right? And she had learned this from her sister who just passed away. Her sister's husband, the one they're trying to get her to marry now, what had, quote, been far from considerate. But his wife had changed his attitude by refusing to eat until he showed better manners. Okay, so she learned this from her sister and she did the same thing. She started fasting and she ended up like chopping off her long hair all as a protest against being encouraged to marry this guy and and to improve her appearance to attract a husband opposing that. So then she goes on to start having these visions mm-hmm. of she continues to have Christly visions, okay? And so I think she might have been like 16 at the time that this happens-ish. She experienced what she describes as a mystical marriage with Jesus, okay? So now she's married to Jesus in her mind. And the controversial aspect of this marriage is the wedding ring. The wedding ring with Jesus is... Not a gold or silver band. It's a band of flesh of the foreskin of Jesus. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just, can you like envision that right now? Like you have foreskin on your finger? Foreskin on her finger. And so, and it was like this whole thing and it was very detailed. And she was like one of those people that like wrote all her letters and stories and books. And so she went on and on and on about describing the foreskin wedding ring. How many carrots do you think that? (laughs) (laughs) Ew, it's snootish. (laughs) Do you think it's like a cubic zagonia or whatever it's called? (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) wow so (laughs) but so people so i don't even know how to how to get this but she implied so in her mind this is all happening in her mind like she's married to jesus in her mind and she has this foreskin (sighs) wedding ring in her mind and people are like Go ahead. Deep dive in this. How do we not just know that these people are not just like high on shrooms or you like know, doing mushrooms or something, taking drugs, hallucinating? They are 100%. It's got to be. But continue. <laughs> so so in her mind, she's married to Jesus. Okay. That's her husband. Okay. She didn't, she, didn't, <laughs> she didn't want to take this. In my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She didn't want to take this earthly husband. She wants her <laughs> mystical magical (laughs) jesus husband in her mind right and she's telling everybody about this foreskin ring that she has but like people are like okay but like we're looking at your finger and it doesn't have a foreskin on it so she's like oh but my foreskin with ring with jesus is invisible this particular foreskin ring is invisible she says so i'm like (laughs) 
I'm cringing at this. <laughs> but it's like, why are people believing this? Why is this like written in history as fact? Like, I have to count when this when we release this. I, I need to count how many times foreskin was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like why would you believe that and so I was like so I'm reading this and so she continued on after this foreskin marriage to Jesus (laughs) she continued with her fasting and ate nothing but the Eucharist for an extended period of time she had a couple so this I read a whole Papal bull, which apparently is like some official Pope document mm-hmm. called the Papal Bull. I read the Papal Bull from 1491 okay, <laughs> for her canonization. And it's largely a lengthy, incoherent Catholic spewing nonsense. Yeah. Not a single complete thought in that thing. But then it goes on and it talks about her fasting. And it said she rejected the use of wine of meat, of every kind of seasoning. She finished by depriving herself of vegetables and took no other bread other than the heavenly bread. Um, Da, da, da. She fasted from Ash Wednesday until the Ascension, which I think is, by my math, like 80-some days. Yeah. Having taken no other food than the Eucharist. So you're trying to tell me that homegirl went 80 days eating nothing but the Eucharist? No. How many calories do you think are in the fucking (laughs) Eucharist? You're dead. You're dead. There's no way. There's, I guarantee there's like negative calories in a Eucharist because of the amount of calories it takes you to chew the Eucharist. Like it's probably (laughs) more than the calories in the Eucharist. And she didn't drink anything. So she's dehydrated. So she didn't drink the wine. And so it says for eight years, she sustained life with a little juice of herbs, which she could not even retain in her stomach. She so went drugs. <laughs> she, um, she flew on the wings of love to the Holy Communion, receiving it almost daily as a celestial banquet. So I'm going to say that to my future husband. <laughs> so this 80 day fast that she has on just the Eucharist. She dies shortly after that, okay? And yeah, I wonder why. She was 33. She was malnourished, okay? Yeah. Like homegirl was only eating Eucharist for 80 days. And like the <laughs> the Catholic Church wants to post it as like this glorious fantastic thing that she was fasting on only the Eucharist. What a saint. What a miracle. No, she died because of it. <laughs> like, she should have married her freaking brother-in-law. <laughs> she would have been alive. Just saying. She would have survived and could have been married to her brother-in-law and actually had a actual ring on her finger. <laughs> so it gets it gets weirder. I, I how? How does it get you? How does it get weirder? <laughs> how does it get weirder? Okay. So now she's dead, right? Um, and then her miracles come by people supposedly touching her dead body or her Many sick persons, by touching her, obtained their cure from God. Others recovered their health by means of the objects which had been in contact with her remains. Okay. Wait, sorry. You also said this was before the bubonic plague or during? Just before. Oh, okay. So let's say she could have died from the plague too. Oh, she could have. Because I, I, I think she was born just before the bubonic plague. So oh, she probably okay. lived through the plague. Oh, yeah. Maybe. So, yeah. Um. So she dies. Her remains go to. So she again, she was from Siena. Her remains ended up somewhere else, maybe in Rome. And the people of Siena wished to have her remains returned to Siena. Okay. A story is told of a miracle. I'm going to read this quote whereby they were partially successful, knowing that. They could not smuggle her whole body out of Rome. They decided to take only her head, which they placed in a bag. Lots of questions already. Mm. Lots of questions. Was her head already severed? Did they go into the Rome Basilica and start just sawing her head off? Like, I don't understand. Anyways, 
When stopped by the Roman guards, they prayed to St. Catherine to help them, confident that she would rather have her body, or at least part thereof, in Siena. When the guards opened, or when they opened the bag to show the guards, it appeared to no longer hold her head, but to be full of, I'll give you one guess of what was in the bag. Eucharist. No. Foreskin. What does does everything turn into? In these miracles. Oh, flowers. Roses. Roses. <laughs> you like how I said foreskin? <laughs> A random bag of it. A bag of foreskin. <laughs> um, all right. So she she's another one that turned into another situation here where we're turning into flowers. Roses. These people went to her body, which was preserved in Rome, took her head. And they were like, yo, we can't take the whole body, but like, we're bringing, <laughs> we're bringing her head back to Siena. What? What's the end goal there? You're just going to have like, just a head? Right. Yeah. A stick, like in the <laughs> church? Like, I don't understand. They have it like on a mantle, like on, a, on an altar that they like go to and visit. So, so then the head, quote unquote, turned to flowers when the guards saw it, right? So now you just lost it. I'll take things that didn't happen for 500, <laughs> Alex. Okay. But yeah, so where is her head? Is her yeah. head still on her body in Rome? So if we weren't like, so yeah, so are you telling me that we need to go to Rome, <laughs> <laughs> find where she is buried or hanging out in and see if there's still a head there? Right. All right. All right, we can take that on. <laughs> a lot of times, though, they like put like prosthetics. They put like a a, a mask, a prosthetic mask or prosthetic head on the remains. So I don't know if we would be able to tell if it was her real head or a prosthetic uh, gotcha, gotcha. head that they had to put because her real head got stolen. Yeah, I don't know. Lots of questions. So, St. Catherine of Siena, people. Oh, she's she's awesome. She's a bad bitch. She's a bad bitch. (laughs) Who you got next? So, this is actually my last one because I only did three saints because I thought if we both did three, that was enough. (laughs) But again, we also deep dived into a whole other world, which is fine. Uh, so mine is St. Hubert of Liege. Uh, Hubert was born in 656, and he is known as the patron saint of rabies. <laughs> you love your rabies. <laughs> it's fitting. So if you guys don't know or picked up on it, I have a fear of rabies. It is one of like my biggest rational affairs. And... Yeah, so this is why I had to pick this dude. <laughs> so he is obviously against rabies. And he's also a patron saint of dogs, forest workers, and hunters, and huntsmen. Oh, and hunting. Hubert was... Hold on, slight. Hubert was the first bishop of Liege in Belgium. His wife died, another one, giving birth to their son. So he withdrew into the forest and gave himself up to hunting. So according to the legend... As, as one does. When they're... <laughs> right? <laughs> In mourning. <laughs> and when you have a child to care of. So according to the legend, St. Peter, the apostle... Wait, his wife died in childbirth or his Yeah, mom? his wife died. Sorry, his wife. Hubert's wife died. So he just abandoned the kid. Son. He had just yep. abandoned the kid to go <laughs> into the forest. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> that beats everywhere. Um, no, I think I want to say I've read something about like his sister. I think he had like a sister that took care of his son after, but again, he took off. <laughs> so not okay. Um, so according to legend, Saint Peter, uh, known as the apostle, visited Hubert and gave him a golden key and told him that God had given him a special power against evil spirits. Angels also presented him with a stole. So the key is St. It's now known as St. Hubert's key. It's a metal nail cross or cone. It was used in Europe 
until the early 20th century as a tradition traditional cure for rabies so guys if you don't know this there's really no cure for rabies if you think you've got bit by something that might be rabid you have to go get a rabies shot <laughs> if you wait too long to go get your shot you're going you and wait too long and you start showing symptoms that's it it's, it's game over so like if you wake up one day and you have a bat in your house you should probably go to the hospital because you don't know if that bat bit you during the night. So, but according to this, this key is the cure for rabies. The <laughs> so cure, to think, the to think cure meaning out. he would stab someone with it and put them out of their misery once they got rabies? Like, I don't <laughs> understand. How does that work? So I'm going to tell you. The key was heated and pressed to the area where a person had been bitten by a dog believed to have rabies. If performed soon after the bite had happened, the heat has the potential to catarize and sterilize the wound, eradicating the rabies virus from the person. I call this bullshit. Because <laughs> if it if it, it did work, why are we still not using this today? That does not sound... No. It sounds to me like the person just never had rabies to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why they didn't go on to exhibit rabies symptoms after they were cauterized by the... Right. But this practice, of course, was endorsed by no other the Catholic Church. <laughs> because it's stupid. <laughs> Just saying. We're in modern medicine now, right? We have all this, te- all this technology, all these vaccines and all these things. We don't have a cure for it. We just have like, it's like almost a preventative. There's a vaccine for it. But you have to take the step and like, okay, shit, I got bit. I don't know the situation. I need to like go to the hospital and go get my vaccine and do it. So we don't have technically a cure for it. We have a way to eradicate it. So if we had a key, if this was an actual cure, this key, St. Hubert's key, why are we still not using it today? (laughs) Just say it. Um... I love how passionate you are about rabies. Just, I just <laughs> yeah. need to say that. And I have not told my rabies story yet on the podcast about my dog. Oh. Not my current dog. My two two dogs ago. Two so, dogs ago. Bailey. I could tell that. On my wedding day. Oh, yes. We have to tell the story. So it... Let's let's do a little flashback. Okay. It's 10 so, years ago. It's 10 years ago like now. Yeah. Like I'm 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 approaching my 10 year wedding anniversary. <laughs> Happy anniversary. As crazy as that is. So 10 years ago, you were in my wedding party, so you were mm-hmm. very in tune and familiar with this story. I had a little white fluffy dog. He was a little Shih Tzu Bichon mix. His name was Bailey. <laughs> he was a, he was a little feisty. But yeah. his name was <laughs> Bailey. Harmless, harmlessly feisty. He was he weighed like 20 pounds. Like, what is he gonna do? Right. So he had never been boarded. We always had him with family if we had to go on a vacation or something like that. But for my wedding, everyone that I could have asked to watch my dog was at the wedding. Mm-hmm. So I had to board him for one one night, two nights. I think I was gonna board him for two nights, like the rehearsal dinner and then the wedding night. So I did. So I boarded him for that first night, the night before my wedding. And it's now eight o'clock in the morning on my wedding day. And we are in the, Kelly and I are in the salon. I'm getting my little bridal updo done. And I get a (laughs) phone call from a random number, but it's local. So I answer it because I don't know who this could be, what this could be about, but it could be important. It's your wedding day. My wedding day. Like calling you. Call me for some reason. So I answer it, and on the other end of the line is a man with a very deep voice, and he says, <laughs> hi, this is Officer So-and-so from the blank local police department. And I said, what now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, what? And he said, I'm, I'm here with your dog, Bailey. And I'm like, <laughs> wait, what? Do you think the two of them were just chilling in the cop car? <laughs> so I'm like my mind is just like already yeah. in like a hundred places it's my wedding morning like I'm a I am like three hours out from being at the altar and 
he proceeds to tell me he's at the hospital. <laughs> it's, not, with, it's funny with now, the, but it wasn't funny at the with time. With a man with a man who worked at the kennel that I boarded my dog at. My dog had bitten this man when he tried to like get him out of his crate or whatever. And the man went to the hospital with a dog bite. And apparently <laughs> yes. protocol is that you have to or a couple the police was informing me that a couple of things could happen. The man could ask for the dog to be tested for rabies. So mm-hmm. he could request that if he wanted to. Um, and he could like press charges or something stupid. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the police officer is explaining all this to me. And he said, and I just need to let you know that the way that they test for rabies is they euthanize the dog and they literally they cut its head off and because there's no other way to test for rabies. You have to euthanize the dog, cut their head off, and that's how you test for rabies. I don't know if they like take their brain out or something and like Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what they do. But Yeah, because it's even hard to test for us. Like we can it's very hard to get tested for us. So this is why they do the vaccine. So I start bawling my eyes out on the phone with the police officer I'm like this. you're gonna cut his head off <laughs> I was like, you can laugh about it now I was just like are you kidding me and I I remember being like no you have to have the wrong dog I was like the white fluffy one like the little 20 pound white fluffy <laughs> one you're gonna cut his head off <laughs> police officer was just like well I just have to inform you I'm just this is protocol whatever and so long story short they the guy decided not to press charges and not to request a rabies test on my dog thank god (laughs) which I don't even understand because he was vaccinated and we had given them all of the vaccination records up front before we boarded him so like what what is the issue and he most likely being an employee for a kennel, he's most likely vaccinated against rabies too. Because if you work with any type of animals in that type of field, you automatically get vaccinated. That trust dog, me, I want to be vaccinated against rabies. <laughs> that dog bit me so many times, and I just want to tell you that like, there it's not a hospitable offense. Like, right, <laughs> you're not going to the hospital for that dog's bite. And yeah. he, he was mad at me sometimes, and he would nip. Like, you ain't going to the hospital for that. The guy right. came out; he's all bandaged up. Okay, we had to go get my dog. We had to send yeah. somebody. Like, I think my mom was. She was like next to do her hair or something. And we were like, no, mom. Like, you have to go pick up Bailey so they don't. And cut mind his head you, off. poor thing. Like, she doesn't know where she's going because she's she's not from the area. Right, right. So we just like sent sent her and like my mother in law out onto mission go save my dog (laughs) and then so so they did they they were able to pick up my dog from the kennel and the kennel said you just have to and we didn't know what what was going to come of all of it at that time but they said you have to come pick him up and you have to quarantine him for 10 days and I said he said no new people no new places 10 days quarantine in your home wonderful I'm leaving tomorrow (laughs) on a honeymoon (laughs) out of the country so that's not gonna apply but so we brought him home and then he was like there in my getting ready pictures yeah, we're, at we're my all house. There. We're all like getting ready. And now I have my dog who's, who's just almost euthanized and he's in all my wedding pictures now, which is kind of cool. Like, yeah, I, liked, I know. I love that. I liked that part of it. But well, and like, then, there you go with the whole like, don't be around new people. <laughs> he was around everybody. Every single person that was coming to my wedding was around that dog. And then... We had some friends who were nice enough to, they left our wedding reception early to drive to our house, which was like half hour away. And then they let the dog, let him out, fed him, all that stuff. And oh, like, yeah. So then we just went back the next morning. So he was fine. But and then he stayed with my parents while I was on on my honeymoon in, in, in his quarantine period. <laughs> That's like I understand, but like when you like I get all the stuff about it. I totally get it because again, I have like a fear of the of this. 
But like in your situation, it's like, hey, I'm showing you I have proof that my dog is vaccinated. You most likely are vaccinated because you work for a kennel. What is the issue now? You know, like, what is the issue? Like, you do not need to turn my dog into a headless horseman. <laughs> like, to, you know what I mean? Like, there's no reason for that. Like, and that, and I'm so it, sorry that happened bog. to you. <laughs> yeah, because that was like on your day of your wedding. And here you are thinking that your dog could get potentially freaking decapitated. Like, the so police. Crazy. Yeah. The police called me. I was like, what? But- <laughs> So Bailey, that was great. Bailey got back at you. He was like, you guys were me and Kendall getting married. I'm going to fuck shit up. <laughs> he was feisty, man. Yeah, he was. He was, he really he was, was. That, he was that dog that like you just you didn't cross him. And if I was out walking him and like a little kid was like, oh, so cute. Like, can I pet your dog? I'd say no. Yeah. No, you may not because he will <laughs> bite you. But He gave zero. He was good. He was like. Anytime I was around him, he never like bit me. He was always good, uh, but he just he gave zero fucks <laughs> he, from the beginning. <laughs> always did. He almost like burned your house down when he chewed up like your computer wires. I still remember that. He just he gave zero zero f's about anything. <laughs> this dog was not to go on like a whole side tangent about this dog because this dog was something else. But last story, just to show you how little fucks he gave about anything he was smart like smart in a way that like he wouldn't do what you asked or anything like that like it wasn't like he was just gonna do tricks he was he was like outsmarting me as like a human yeah (laughs) he was so into food and, and food obsessed and like getting into our food all the time he would pretend that he had to go outside to the bathroom. So he would he would walk up to the door. Like if we were sitting down on a TV tray eating dinner, watching TV, right. right? He'd run up to the door and he'd bark like his normal thing. Like he needs to go outside. So I would get up and I'd walk over to the door to let him out. I'd open the door and that bastard would run back and start <laughs> eating my dinner off of the like he'd get up on the couch and just like inhale my dinner like by the time I got back he had like half of it gone and I was like you bastard (laughs) it's so true every time oh I love that story I love that story so much yeah like and obviously not to keep talking about your dog because I can talk (laughs) about dogs all day but I still remember so you had him and then a few years later you ended up getting Lana um your other dog and i just remember like oh lana doesn't do like she doesn't eat any human food she's good like she doesn't even know what human food is yet blah blah blah. and then i don't know if it was like a couple of visits later i came up and that was it she became like food obsessed because she learned it from the little white one <laughs> she oh he corrupted her the worst thing that we ever did was overlap those two dogs because he <laughs> was a bastard and he taught her she was the sweetest dog and she learned all her bad habits from him <laughs> it was the best like all of a sudden one day i'm like he bailey would eat toilet paper all the time like he yeah. just eat the whole oh, like just that. chop the whole you toilet know? paper roll and she started eating the toilet paper roll and i'm like this is not you this is bailey <laughs> bailey taught you this <laughs> we corrupted oh, her you can talk about dogs all day <laughs> listen all dogs go to heaven all saints all souls full circle we're back to saints (laughs) back to saints so my end note here so okay we said the practice uh this practice with the key was endorsed endorsed by the catholic church so it is said that hubert cured a man who had been bitten by a rabbit dog and he became known and this is how he became known as a protector against this deadly disease he died in May 30 on May 30th, 727 AD. And after his death, people visit his shrine in hope to in hope to protect them from rabies. So, so. when are you booking your ticket? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll be there. <laughs> Where is it located? Uh let me go back. Did I not get it? Oh, uh Belgium? Oh, cool. I'd like to visit Belgium. Yeah. So, yeah, we could do it. I can go and you guys can go and I'll go pray (laughs) so you can protect me from rabies. I came up with this woman in my travels. (laughs) 
on the Google. <laughs> and her name is Maria Goretti. Okay. Maria Goretti. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, sounds, we're sounds in, you know. We're in Italy. All right. Early 1900s. That's our setting. Okay. Let's let's introduce you to a couple of characters here. So okay. Maria Goretti had some siblings and her mom, her dad had died. And when her dad died, she had to move in with this other family on a farm just so they could have a place to live and make ends meet and work and whatever. And so this other family that she moved in with was the Serenelli family. And there was this boy, Alessandro Serenelli. His oh, mother- hot. He sounds hot. <laughs> he sounds hot. <laughs> Alessandro. <laughs> he sounds like he's like an attractive man. He's a murderer. Okay. Oh, I would. <laughs> I would be into him. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> so his mother died in a psychiatric hospital when he was a few months old after she tried to drown him as a newborn. Oh, shit. Not really relevant totally to the story, but I thought that was just yeah. interesting factoid. So what's the, what's the mom thing after the, um, forgive me. I can't postpartum. Think of it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so she tried, that, to, probably. she tried to drown him, got committed to a psych ward, and then died a few months later. So I don't know about all that. But he also had a brother who committed suicide while studying in the seminary <sighs> to become a priest. So Alessandro lived a tough yeah. life. Okay, Bad environment, tough environment. Tough environment. He's 20. Goretti's 11. Okay. okay. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. So they are all living and working together on this farm. Goretti's inside doing some housework. Everybody's out on the farm. He comes in and he tries to like have sex with her. He tries to advance himself onto her. She forcibly denies him like absolutely not. No, no, no. This is a sin. No, no, no. Right. God wouldn't want this. This is a sin. That's kind of her take. He gets really pissed that she's denying him. And then he grabs, it's called an awl, A-W-L, which I looked it up and it looks like, it's like a woodworking a woodworking tool and it looks kind of like a screwdriver. So this 10 oh, inch, okay. inch awl, it looks like a flathead screwdriver. Mm-hmm. Stabbed her 14 times with that. Oh. You man. know, her, her mother and other people hear screaming. They come in, they see her call a little, 911, whatever, the people come to take her to the hospital. Okay. She underwent surgery without anesthesia, but her injuries were beyond the doctor's help. <laughs> Quote, halfway through the surgery, she woke up. The pharmacist said to her, Maria, think of me in paradise. She looked at him and said, well, who knows which of us is going to be there first? You, Maria, he replied. <laughs> Oh, shit. So, that, first of all, that's like, that's fucked. We gotta stop right there because, like, that's fucked up, right? Like, you don't just be like, yo, you're gonna die. Um, that's horrible bedside manner. <laughs> <laughs> you, you would definitely be there first, Maria. Well, he's got a point, but <laughs> it's like, dang. And then she, so she replies, then I will gladly think of you, she said. She also expressed concern for her mother's welfare the following day. 24 hours after the attack, having expressed forgiveness for Alessandro and stating that she wanted to have him in heaven with her, she died of her injuries. So part of her, because you're just like, okay, she was 11. Yeah. And she, the only thing that happened to her was she died. Like, how did she become a saint? Do you know right. what I mean? Like somebody murdered her. It's super sad, right? But how does that make you a saint? And so... One of the things that I think she's known for, I don't know if she's the patron saint of it or if people pray to her for, is like forgiveness because mm-hmm. she forgave her murderer, supposedly, 24 hours after the attack, like right before she died. And to me, I'm just like, all right, so you just told me this this poor girl got stabbed 14 times and then underwent surgery without anesthesia. She is delirious. Like, right. yeah. she didn't, like... Does does this does this forgiveness hold up in a court of law? Because <laughs> was she of sane mind when she gave that forgiveness? It, yeah, right. It wouldn't be. Nope. 
How are you forgiven the person who fucking murdered you 24 hours Four after hours. they did it? So she should just be a saint for having surgery without anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> that should be it right there. So yeah, no. So I'll I'll continue on here. There was wounds everywhere. Okay, so like just to give you an idea of the state she was in when she made this forgiveness. Okay, she was she was uh, penetrated in her throat, in her heart, her lungs, her diaphragm. So the surgeons were surprised that she was still alive at all. In She had a dying deposition. So in the presence of the chief of police, she told her mother that Alessandro had been sexually harassing her and had two previous attempts made to rape her. She was afraid to reveal it earlier because he threatened to kill her. So that she said all that in her dying deposition, I guess. Mm -hmm. A third account of the assault was presented by some Italian historian in 1985. He asserted that while in prison, Alessandro stated he did not complete the assault and meaning that he didn't get to rape her because she resisted and then he killed her. So she died. Maria died a virgin. And I, as true as that may be, that just seems real convenient for the plot. <laughs> right. Like, do you need to be a, so my first thought when I read that was like, do you need to be a virgin to become a saint? And then I looked it up and apparently like, I don't know that it's necessarily stated as a requirement for sainthood, but like vast majority of the saints are virgins or people who have like, taken vows of chastity and like denounced sex and all that shit and i'm like so it just seems odd that like all of a sudden they have this account of like after the fact oh it's confirmed that the rape didn't actually occur so it's okay she's a virgin we can confirm her sainthood like right 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 what yeah and like in 1985 like it was so far it was so long after that occurred it just seemed like too conveniently for the story aligned like, with like her canonization like oh oh yeah we would make her a saint but she's tainted because she got yeah. raped right 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 like but oh oh yeah you know i do recall that one time in jail when uh Lissandra told me that he never got to finish the job like <laughs> what in the world this is so effed up so it shouldn't matter if she is a virgin or not. Like this poor lady, this poor young girl was, I guess I assume I'm going to say raped. We're not really sure. Or right. at least attempted rape. That's just enough already right there. Right. And then killed. And it's like, F you people. That, like, who, like who cares if she was a virgin or not? Right. But like that's how effed up like the Catholic Church is in you know that they would have been like, oh, we can't make her a saint because she's not pure. Do you know what I mean? So, because I did a bunch of dudes and they weren't fucking, one Hubert had a freaking kid and he can cure rabies. Get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Catholic church. <laughs> oh my God. So, the the thing that like, messes me up about this one is so this guy who murdered her of this alessandro mm -hmm. character so they go to trial he gets sentenced to 30 years he was going to get sentenced to life but because he was only 20 years old and because of his quote he grew up poor and in a neglectful family with sev several brothers and relatives suffering from madness and an alcoholic father end quote that's the reason that he didn't get a life sentence it was 30 years so the mother of maria who died mm -hmm. plea she she made a plea for them not to give him the the life sentence also not give him to not give him a okay. death sentence or a life sentence or anything like that and he so he went away for a while was like not sorry for his sins not talking to anybody he just kind of like went into jail and nobody heard from him again and then a local bishop so after three years of him being in jail a local bishop went to visit him in jail he wrote a thank you note to the bishop 
asking him for prayers and blah, blah, blah. He eventually gets released 30 years later after he does his full sentence, right? right. Mm -hmm. He visits the mother, begs for forgiveness. She forgives him. They attend mass together the next day, receiving Holy Communion side by side. He reportedly prayed to the girl he killed every day and referred to her as my little saint. Mm -hmm. So why did you have to kill her, though? He then goes on to become a lay brother living in a monastery and working as its receptionist and gardener until he died in 1970 at the age of 87. So he can do that. <sighs> he can work in a monastery and become all holy and stuff. As a murderer. As a murderer. But this poor girl gets raped and killed. And you're going to give her a hard time for being a saint because she's not a quote unquote virgin. So I don't know. I don't know. They apparently her brothers, her brothers all claimed miracles on her behalf, which. Like, are we taking are we taking family member accounts now? Like, right. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. You know what I mean? Like, I understand it's a sensitive subject because she got murdered. But like, at the same time, it's like her only miracles are all like her siblings saying that they prayed to her and she granted some miracle for them. Yeah. Like, one of them. <laughs> like these don't even count as miracles. Like Do one have, of like, her a stranger telling us that they prayed to her. <laughs> and they were, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, but oh, so even that though, like, so these, one of the brothers claims that she intervened miraculously in their, in his life he heard a voice, he heard her voice telling him to emigrate to America. Is that a miracle? No. No. Because <laughs> like, they just come into America. <laughs> like <laughs> Another one said he heard her voice telling him to stay in his trench when the rest of his unit charged the Germans in World War I. He was the only survivor of that charge. That's not a miracle. That's a uh, like a forewarning, like a warning. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Like a sign. I don't know. Like she's warning you not to go because if you go, you're going to die. Maybe he was just a chicken. <laughs> or that too. <laughs> I the just. Possibility. I struggle with these miracle stories because like, what's the like it always says like so for the process of becoming a saint it's like you have to have your miracles and stuff like investigated by the catholic church mm. and then they have to be confirmed miracles what's the process for the investigation because like the catholic church will just come in like a fucking hundred years later and be like yep that person who said that they saw that thing that's credible. Well, I'm just gonna put this out there, and this might offend people, but the Catholic Church needs to be investigated itself <laughs> as a whole, <laughs> as, a, as a whole freaking unit, okay? <laughs> the whole thing. And like, I so, couldn't find. I don't think they're they're, they're in the business to be investigating miracles. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't. I'll admit I didn't look very hard, but I did try to like Google like. Oh, wait, wait, out of all the research that you did, <laughs> you did not look hard at this. No. So I was like Googling, like, I want to know where are the investigative documents for the canonization <laughs> process? And like, I could come across like some things where like they were just talking about the person like after they had been canonized. But I couldn't yeah. actually find like, where's the, actual... the, the, give me like the deliberation room yeah. notes. I want yeah. the minutes from the deliberation room of when you were like trying to decide whether or not something that happened 200 years ago was oh, that's all that's in the cloud somebody had a vision of <laughs> somebody had a vision of mary and you're gonna right confirm or deny that vision as credible well, could you because you're ridiculous mom, could your mom be a saint since she sees like jesus in in like in her toast and like whatever it is <laughs> <laughs> she sees her visions all the time right yeah so 
I'm gonna put she... I'm gonna put in a bid for Susanna. <laughs> why can't she be a saint? Oh wait, she has to be a virgin. Sorry. <laughs> she had you, Melissa. She can't be. I guess it's okay for men, but not women. <laughs> right, exactly. So needless to say, Maria's remains are kept in some crypt somewhere south of Rome. Oh, it is my heart hurts for her. It is she was 11, like that's horrible. Yeah. It is often incorrectly reported that her body remained incorrupt, which means like it didn't decompose. That's mm-hmm. like a a theme here, but after her death. This is because her skeletal remains are contained in a wax statue lying on its back inside a glass casket and the statue has been mistaken for her body. It's just like it's just a classic. Like I had to read that line because I'm just like this is the explanation for everything. It's just like yeah. people just don't know the truth or the science behind shit. Right. And they don't have the information available to. So they have to make pretty much. They make just make shit up. up. They need to fit there. Like, oh, her body didn't decompose. She must be holy. <laughs> no, it's isn't a fucking there, wax statue. Isn't like, there like a body? Don't don't we have like a body of somebody like in the church in one of the, the church our big church there? I guess I could say the church Senians. Isn't there like something down there going on? Our listeners could tell us. I always thought I heard that there was a like you could go down there and pray, but it's like a body of maybe. I'll have to look that up. See, a pre- I thought I heard this and I only found out about this like not too long ago and I was like, what? Obviously, it's like, you know, we don't go to that church, so we don't know. Mm. And I was like, what do you mean? There's like a body in like, I don't know if it's like in the basement. I could be totally. It's got to be one of these because they put, they're called like relics of the saints where like it could be a body. It could be a body part. There's something in that church. Maybe like the next time you're down, we can go take a look. (laughs) You can go there. You can go and like pray, I guess. We should check it out. Just saying. (laughs) <laughs> a, a saint a saintly body part i can't wait yeah i don't know if it's like a saint or a priest or something like somebody somebody's down there but that's what they would do and then like the thing that annoys the crap out of me is like they would just exhume these bodies like there was one and i don't even know if i'm gonna get to it today probably not but it was it was a saint that basically like they exhumed her body three times mm-hmm. they kept like digging her up putting her back digging her up putting her back and like just to like check on like the state of decomposition and shit. And I'm like, and they would they would marvel at like, oh, it, like it's not as decomposed as like a body should be for this amount of time. And it's like, well, a yeah, there's so many you're not reasons. digging up, you're not <laughs> digging up every other body. Like you're happening to dig this one up, and then you're just saying calling her a saint because she still had a little skin on the bone and I'm right, like right right it's it's just ridiculous and like like there's scientific reasons like depending yeah. on where she was buried and like the where soil type like was buried, it the soil was it a loose, to- a loose yeah. soil or was it like a clay that wouldn't let any air in and that's yeah. why she's so well preserved and it's just the like time of year like it just yeah so many things and so the fact that they just would equate that automatically with like it, you must be holy, yeah, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. I think a lot of these they just needed something to fit their narrative, so they just went with you know like hey she she doesn't look you know she's not all she's not all just bones she's got some skin so she's got to be a saint like this is this is this is crazy she's been buried this long and she still has skin on her you know she's she's a saint right and so the one that i'm talking about that got exhumed a bunch of times it was like bernadette of luge Mm -hmm. um and she had like visions of mary whatever and then they exhumed her a bunch of times and they said that they would do like the wax molds for the face because so they would keep these bodies like in like a glass case like under the altar or whatever and they said people people would think if they saw her face as it truly was with like blackened sunken eyes and nose and everything like the natural state of decomposition that she was in that they would think that her body was not incorrupt as they say so then they would make a they would take like impressions of her face and go make like a wax mask to put over her decomposing body 
so that people it would be like well preserved and it right. would keep, keep up appearances of like oh her body's holy it's not decomposing it's like no it's a wax m- mask that you made because <laughs> her body is decomposing and you're afraid that people are going to know it's decomposing so, so you just it. cover it up with a mask instead it's like, like their a version of botox <laughs> it's so ridiculous you know, yeah that's that that's ridiculous first of all you shouldn't be we shouldn't be viewing any that like let them like they're dead let them be let them rest do you think that they want to be dismembered yeah no and like are you getting permission to do this or is the catholic church just fucking doing it themselves like are they trying to find out where these like families are where the families are today like are they doing like an ancestry to see if there's any like civil any like you know late late great children you know all that stuff Are they doing any of that and getting permission or are they just taking it upon themselves and just opening it up and looking at it and examining it? They'll just be like, we'll make you a saint. We'll make you a saint if you let (laughs) us chop you up. It's the Catholic Church. They do whatever the fuck they want. (laughs) It's crazy. I don't even know. I don't even know how to how to end this. So I know you're done with your saints. The only other one I had, it's like a one liner. Yeah, let's throw it in there. St. Clair of Assisi. So I've heard of St. Francis of Assisi. I had not heard of St. Clair of Assisi, but I think they were associated. Maybe St. Francis is the animal one. I don't know. We could be confusing those. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We could be confusing those. So this one, I'm not going to go. I don't even know her whole life story, but Mm -hmm. I honed in on this like one sentence because I was just like, this is so stupid. Pope Pius designated Claire as the patron saint of television in 1958 on the basis that when she was too ill to attend mass, she had reportedly been able to see it and hear it on the wall of her room. So what does that make you think of immediately? Hear it in the wall of her room? She could, she could, so she was too sick to go to mass. Yeah. But she claims that she could see the mass, like she would look up at like the ceiling or the wall of her room and she could see the mass playing as if it were playing on a tv on her wall i'm just thinking like drugs so it makes me think of queen's gambit <gasps> yes when she could see beth harman is playing she's on horse tranquilizers at the orphanage yes and she can on see drugs <laughs> yes exactly and she can see the chess board on the ceiling and she like plays games of chess in her mind yes because of the horse tranquilizer and you're just like but yeah, we're gonna go and make these people a saint. A saint. When there's like a, other reasons for their hallucinations. <laughs> so yeah. So more and more as we talk about these, I'm like, I definitely feel like there was a lot of like hallucinogenic drugs involved in these stories. Well, and it says this is happening when she's too ill to attend mass. So you know she's got some fucking lead-based cough syrup with some <laughs> shit that they're lacing it with and like exactly no wonder she could see stars right we're gonna touch real briefly on our mental health segment because we don't want to lose that we don't want to forget about it or push it to the side but we'll do real quick like kind of light ones for today we won't go in depth too far you want to go first yeah sure so my health mental health tip is just going for a nice walk with my dog my non rabid dog. <laughs> so that's always a plus. I just like to go on my walks with her because not only is she the love of my life, but walking just kind of just helps me focus on my body, my mind, and helps me relieve my anxiety. So as simple as that. Are you going to now take a Hubert key with you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I wonder if you can find one. How awesome would that be? I, I'm sure you could. No doubt in my mind that that's sold on Amazon. It's like Catholic buy Catholic crap dot com. You could buy the you could buy the Eucharist on Amazon. So yeah, you can. Yeah, you can buy a Hubert key probably. I I offended one of my coworkers when I said something about buying the Eucharist on Amazon. I'm like, oh, you can just buy them on Amazon. Why are you going to church? And she was offended by it. So. I was like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. They're not blessed. <laughs> oh, my God. I wonder if it has, like, the nutritional facts on the back of the <laughs> box, though, because 
I need to know how Catherine of Siena survived for 80 survived days. for 80 days on Eucharist alone. Right. Never. If it was a pop sook, it'd be a different story. Yes. Mm-hmm. But it's not. No. So my mental health thing is just a weighted blanket. I bought one. I don't know the weight specifically of the one I bought. I think it might have been like a 15 pounder. I don't know how to check. I must be able to go back through my Amazon history and check. But I think it was a 15 pound weight blanket. And I used to put it across the whole bed. And my husband and I both would sleep under this weighted blanket. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was fantastic. But he said it was like aggravating his like restless leg syndrome for some reason, which it does the opposite for me. Like it literally... I'm in a coma when I'm under that thing. Yeah. I do not move for the whole night. I get like the best, most restorative sleep. (laughs) But since he stopped wanting to sleep under it, I fold it in half. So it's it's like 30 pounds. (laughs) I think. I don't know. But I fold it in half. So it's like twice as heavy. And sometimes it's like a little bit too much. Like I'm like, oh, I don't think my heart can pump my blood through my body anymore because I think it's a little too heavy. But needless to say, it is helpful. Just find, speak to your doctor about what the right weight is (laughs) for you and and your circulatory system. (laughs) Like that. Yep. (laughs) I know. I do need to get one of those. I keep saying I need need to just do it and just get it. Get one. They are a pain in the ass in the sense that they're super heavy to like yeah. move around anywhere like when yeah. it's like oh i gotta wash this thing it's like what do i do with this like it's it weighs 30 pounds like i'm trying do to you like, feel like it gets thing. once like the heat you start kicking the heat on like in the winter and you and if you use it in the winter is it too hot with it it's supposedly it's like a cool, not? no so it's supposedly like cool technology or something like that mm-hmm. so it's not supposed to make you overheated by using it because it's not hot i don't know how it breathes but somehow it's supposed to breathe or stay cool it's a miracle it's a miracle it's a miracle (laughs) blanket so that's that's really what we got for saints for you today enjoy enjoy the rest of all saints day (laughs) happy happy saints day